Our next speaker is Ron Nixon, and he founded the private equity firm, The Catalyst Group, in 1990. Over his career, he's participated in over 200 separate transactions, managing TSG's eight previous limited partnerships. Um, and obviously, I think he was the first, what, million or $2 million investor into LHC Group back in, was it 97? Is that about right? Oh, I'm sorry, 2000. So as, as many of you know, Ron's also the CEO of Sonera MedTech, which uh, you know, has a pretty good audience on, on MicroCap Club. And, um, and Sonera, Sonera's basically been a culmination of kind of people, IP, partnerships, businesses that Ron has pieced together over 15 years. A lot of people see what it is today. And this presentation isn't about Sonera, but I think um, Sonera is one that we can all connect with because it's kind of in the real, real time what he's been able to do multiple times to creating platforms in different industries. And um, I think we're going to have a, an incredible learning lesson on how to look at a business as an investor and also as an operator of one, which is what Ron represents. So thanks, Ron, for being here. Thank you, Ian. I appreciate that. And uh, thank you for letting me come to the Microcap Club. I know many of you guys. Uh, I've met many of you before at uh, multiple times. And so thank you for allowing me to do that. One, one of the things I want to do is clear up one thing with Keith. And that is Keith is always understated on his impact of the business. He loves to give the credit to everybody else. He built a culture that is second to none and everybody should try to implement that culture. He drove a white pickup truck, and his space was always right there in the very front of the building. He never parked in that space. He parked in the back of the building. And so he just really led by example, and I don't think he would claim some of the things he did, like this SPV tool, that, uh, uh, the, the service value point system tool that was built. He built that, and it was incredibly complex and at the core of it what it would do for you is with these thousands of diagnosis because you got all these multi comorbidities with each one of these patients our patients had like on average nine comorbidities so they're very sick people and so you had all this combination and many of those would be COPD or CHF or congestive heart failure and then many other things that go with that and we had five major comorbidities that kind of drove all 80% of your costs back then. And that would be COP, COPD, CHF, hypertension, mobility, and diabetes. And then if you think about that, <clears throat> you add all these other complexities to it. So taking that data and building this bell curve so that you could take the people that are left when he talked about people didn't have to use it what would happen is they would show up left of the bell curve. And what would happen when they did it? You, they would be in the middle of the bell curve. But there are also people, clinicians doing things that were unique that you said, whoa, look at what's happening with this data. And the data says we should incorporate, change the gold standard to a different standard that is inside of LHC. So the whole bell curve kept continuing to move to the right. And that's why the company, I think it's, I don't know where it is today, Keith, but it was over 41 quarters of the highest quality scores in the industry, which that's pretty remarkable for a home health care company. And it's also what gave rise to this all public information that uh, the company sold for $170 a share. We went public at $14 a share, okay? So it was quite a ride and it was uh, very impactful. And what was also thoughtful about the board and Keith's drive was to find the ultimate place to put this company with that would allow for the company to continue to grow, service more patients, and with the position that United's got through all their patient coverage around the, around the country, they were perfect for that. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you because he's a remarkable leader and somebody and a remarkable friend, and we've had a 22, 23-year relationship that's been fantastic so and we've tried to pattern a number of things that we do off of what we learned at LHC during that time period so thank you very much for uh, allowing me to come speak to you guys this morning and um, but one of the things I wanted to talk about is uh, so when I was coming up here <clears throat> 
I, I screwed up and actually ended up having my wife in the back of the airplane, and I was up front. So I made a swap on that and said, if I want to, I've been married 45 years, if I want to make 46, I probably shouldn't put her in the back of the airplane. <laughs> okay, so I switched with her, and I sat next to Martin, who was flying in from Germany by way of stopping in Denver. And so we had this long talk. I got to hear about Martin coming in and telling me all about how he started his first business at 14. He's an entrepreneur, all the various things he's done. And then we just talked investing and so forth. So it was delightful. And that's what I love about the Microcap Club. Everybody I've met has that. And then I meet Mark. And um, so Mark's coming in with his wife from New Jersey. And we're on the same bus on the shuttle coming in. We start talking about the usual stuff, which is kids baseball and all the other things in life. And then I said, why are you here? And he said, I'm here for a conference on the Microcap Club. And then Mark goes, I think we met in Austin. And I said, and I look at his face, I said, I knew I knew you. So then we start talking about leadership. And we start talking about how do you find good companies? And so we look at it the same way, whether it's private or whether it's public, we think you should still have the same approach. And leadership has got to be the top thing that you have to look for because it's really hard to succeed if you don't have a quality leader at the very top leading your organization. And in fact, in Ian's talk, when he showed um, uh, John Madden, so John Madden, when he was at, Ian probably doesn't know this, but when John Madden was, I've never shared this with him, when John Madden uh, was at San Diego State, Don Coryell was his mentor, all right? And then underneath Joe Madden was Joe Gibbs. And Joe Gibbs happens to be a really good friend of mine that I've known for more than 10 years. And he is maybe the most remarkable team builder I've ever seen. So it's something that I've spent a lot of time uh, working on and looking at and incorporating this into the businesses that we have. Joe showed me how you make sure everybody in your organization knows what the strategy is and where you're going to go. And it's remarkable how he would do that. So he would never let the defense have a meeting separate from the offense. They wanted everybody to know everything about what was going on. And to show you how remarkable he was, I don't know if any of you know this, but he's actually the only coach in football that actually went to the Super Bowl five times, won it three times, but he won all three times with three different quarterbacks. So compare that to Belichick having Brady, and Brady leaves, and look what happened to Belichick. So it's really interesting. So Joe was really driven by that. But not only was he remarkable in football, he decides to go start a NASCAR team. And if you talk to him about it, I said, how'd that come about? And he said, I always knew I wanted to be a NASCAR owner and be a NASCAR. And so he went to a friend of his to talk to him about being a sponsor. And he said, um, and this is the uh, owner of Interstate Battery. So perfect kind of sponsor for NASCAR. And, and he said, Norm, I want to go start a NASCAR team. He goes, great. So who's your driver going to be? He goes, don't know. He said, well, what brand are you going to have? He goes, uh, don't know. He goes, what do you know? He goes, I don't want to start a team. And he goes, all right, count me in. So Joe then built his strategy, and it was so unique and so interesting how he did it. So back then when he started in the early 90s, what, what was going on in NASCAR? Well, the, the pit crew were 60-year-old white guys that smoked and drank like fish, all right? And they were overweight. So what did Joe do? Joe goes out and recruits all of the athletes that don't make it to the NFL, and he starts bringing them in, and he starts looking at the time differential when he has the, the crew going on. Everybody has adopted that today. If you go to Joe Gibbs' uh, facility in Huntersville, North Carolina, you'll see a weight room and a workout facility that will rival any club in, in the country. And so he just systematically started looking strategically at what could you do. 
And so roll forward, where is Joe today? He's, he has, um, he's in the Hall of Fame for football, but he's also in the Hall of Fame for NASCAR. Only guy to be a two major sport Hall of Famer in recent times. And so I found that fascinating. And so I think there's a lot of lessons there to be learned. And uh, what we've always done at Catalyst, and I'll talk about that in just a few minutes, but is, is really try to take the best of all leadership that we find. And, um, you know, and so one of the things before I get to Catalyst, I'll tell you, um, in studying leadership, because I agree with Mark that that's a really, really critical component, but you also have to have the other components. You've got to have an industry that's a cooperative industry that's a growing industry. And I used to not think that. So I used to look in the early 90s <clears throat> for companies that were just good companies within their industry. But I didn't spend enough time focused on the quality of the industry and where it's going. And I still remember like yesterday because what I've learned is the mistakes you make, you hope they get burned into the back of your mind because and they will so that you can apply that to, to, to the thinking my dad told my oldest son one day my, my oldest son learned a lot from his mistakes and my uh, dad told him one day he said Burke he said it is fabulous that you're learning from your mistakes but you can't learn everything from your mistakes <laughs> so and that was code for get your ducks in a row and start thinking through your your problem solving there but what we've, what we've done, I'm, I'm going to point out a couple of people besides Keith, because Keith is one of those great examples of having all those great leadership qualities, which is not only a great strategic thinker, but somebody can think all the way through to the most micro of decisions that need to be made, not to make those decisions, but to know how to manage those decisions. That's how you get fooled as a great manager, is if you don't know the details underneath you, you don't know how to evaluate what your team leaders are telling you if you don't really know the details and you're only standing at a high level. And so from my perspective, great leaders always know how to go down to the micro level, but they don't manage at the micro level. But they've gotta be a great strategic thinker to understand where's their industry going, who are the competition in this industry? How are we gonna beat the competition? And then how do I communicate to our team, all our team leaders all the way down through? And Keith was talking about his daily email. It was incredibly insightful emails that would be sent out. And he would invite everybody to, if you've got a problem, call. And I think I remember once Keith getting a call and it was really important and this brave nurse picked up the picked uh, sent an email and said we've got a problem and it clearly got dealt with and but people weren't afraid to do that so he not only was communicating well but it was a cooperation as well you got to have communication cooperation etc and <clears throat> I look back at some of the great couple of great examples of leadership and you take um, Izzy Sharp. Who knows who Izzy Sharp is in this room? Okay, so we got a couple people. So Izzy Sharp founded Four Seasons. So you think, man, this guy must have been a great hotelier before he founded Four Seasons. He had no idea what went on in, inside of a hotel. He was a construction guy. But he had a vision for what needs to change in this industry of hotels. So what did he do? He did a number of things like he was, the, he was the first to create a resort atmosphere inside the city. And he'd started this in Canada, where he's from, with a motel and built it so that when you came, you could look out and go, wow, I feel like I'm in another location. And then he brought concierge services from Europe to do that. He brought high-end linens into the industry and people were more comfortable with great beds, et cetera, put the first workout facility in a hotel. So he just went on and on and on creating this unbelievable um, outcome. It sold for 54 times EBITDA to Bill Gates. 
That's a pretty incredible number. You gotta have a pretty interesting calculator to make that math work, okay? And so, and it, by the way, it did never work, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> and so, so, and I know this about him because one of the things that we did at Catalyst is go in the hotel business under a special purpose vehicle with one of the partners that, that helped me get started at Catalyst. And that was a gentleman by the name of Dan Freakin, and it was his family that uh, backed us when we first started, and they had no reason to back a 33-year-old guy with no experience of significance making investments, but they did. And so we did Aubert's Resorts Collection. If anybody knows about that, it started with a handful of properties, but they were unbelievably good properties. And, and the handful always were getting awards, but they didn't, they couldn't ever expand. So, and they ran a process for for Aubert's Resorts collection, and he didn't find any, he sent, they sent out 125 books, and he didn't take any deals from them. And one month later, when I called him, I said, I heard you ran a process, why didn't it work? And he told me, and I said, well, I've got a solution for you. I said, first off, don't take this the wrong way, but you fancy yourself as a developer besides a hotelier. And no offense, you're a lousy developer. And I said, so don't get mad. You're a great hotelier, but you're a lousy developer. And I said, I've seen the carcasses around where it takes two or three owners before you make any money, before your development ever makes money. And I said, we can fix that. And I said, I've got the Michael Jordan of hospitality that I'm bringing with me. So who did I bring? I brought Craig Reed, who ran all the Americas and all the ownership relationships with him and he they had sold out to bill gates and i said how often do you interface with bill gates and he said i've never met him four seasons had been owned by bill gates for eight years and he did not know the guy that controls all his investor relations and and so then i said told dan Freakin, we can get this guy so we did and i'll just roll forward so we got that and I said, let's do a five, Dan and I said, let's do a five, 50 in five. Let's see if we can get 50 hotels in five years. And, and um, Craig Reed said to me, it's impossible. I said, well, why? He said, well, Four Seasons has never been able to accomplish that. And I said, we're not Four Seasons. I said, we need to develop a plan that we can do 50 in five. Well, we did, we did 47 and six. So we didn't make 50 and five, but we did 47 and was voted number one brand globally two years ago. And it's, and then they jettisoned me, they didn't need me anymore, and they got Michael Dell and BDT, Byron Trot, and they've, this all publicly announced, and so they've come in to bring capital and minority, in a minority position to expand this globally. I think it will be the next big hotel company. And so, to me, all that's about strategy, getting the right leader, and Craig happened to be the right leader. So, and, but, and before I jump into Catalyst, I'll give you a little background on how I got started. So I'm an engineer by background, and so I had a mentor that said, go learn how things work, and then become a business guy. And so that's what I did. And so I started my first company at 26 years old, and then back then there was no term private equity. That actually didn't come around until about 94. So we were always lumped in. Private equity was lumped in with venture capital. And it was just like, well, we're early stage and you're later stage. But they're polar opposite of what they really are, and you guys all know that. And so, um, but I'd worked for an investment firm as an operating guy and made a deal with them that if I did a good job on the operation front, I'll come on to the to up there with you and we're gonna start doing acquisitions. Then I decided I could do it on my own with a couple of partners that I'd been talking to. And so we said, let's go see if we can raise some capital. And so one of the investors that was working with this company came to me and said, I'll back you. And I said, well, how about we do, he wanted me to just go buy one company. And I said, how about we go buy multiple companies then you'd be a partner in that. So then we went to Service Corp International Anybody know who Service Corp is? 
So it's the largest funeral home company in the world, started by a guy, by a guy named Bob Waltrip. <clears throat> and Bob is an incredible guy that backed many, many people. He had a gut feel for people, and he would back them and start businesses. And I think Bob probably created a dozen public companies outside of Service Corp. But he also was mentoring to me along the way and telling me things not to do and how expansion almost killed Service Corp because of the way that they were doing that. But he also, when he first started, he had three of his board members, his CFO and himself and a couple other people, and I'm 33 and they're all older. And, and this is a funeral home company. So the walls were velvet red, okay? Not a good look, okay? And so we're all in this big boardroom. And I said, well, Mr. Waltrip, I said, look, we want to add value to these portfolio companies. We want to buy them and we want to build them. And I don't know how long that's going to take, but we want a really long partnership so that we are not hampered by time. And I said, but if we can't find good deals, we'll give, we'll give you your money back. And he had a big country draw and he said, son, he said, I know where you live and I know how to bury you, so I'm not worried about it. <laughs> and so, and I wasn't real sure how to take that. So <laughs> anyway, but he became a partner with us and then the Friedkin family did as well. They wouldn't mind me telling you that. And they own Gulf States Toyota, which is the largest master distributor for Toyota in the world. And they do about 14 billion a year public, that's a public knowledge, but they're the largest private private firm in Texas, and they distribute to five states around. A little side note, Dan Friedkin, who's a phenomenal guy, and great business guy, he also owns a Roma soccer team. So I've become a soccer fan. <laughs> so anyway, but um, back to the, uh, the, the besides Keith and Izzy Sharp, there's another one like that, and that was Alan Mul Mulally, who came into Ford. Do you guys remember him? They wrote a book about him called The American Icon. I would tell you if you want to read a couple of really good books, read The Four Seasons, because it's got tons of metric-driven strategies in there that he talks about, and Malali is the same way. And most people don't know this. He was passed over for the CEO job, said no consideration at all for him. So when Ford was in, its di in the ditch, as big as it was, they came back in and recruited him, and he went over there. And he started building metrics and doing it exactly like Keith did and had all those same traits that those three guys share, which I think is the mark of great, great leadership. And, and, and in doing so, Malali then turned Ford around. They wrote that book. He was phenom. Don't you know Boeing the way Boeing is today? They kind of probably wish they hadn't have passed him over for CEO job because they don't have great leadership as demonstrated by lack of transparency on how their business has been working over the last few years. Years And there were a lot of questions about the board. Shame on that board for not acting on that because you know they knew as well. And if they didn't know, they're not very good board members. So now with that, I'll turn to Catalyst and tell you a little bit about Catalyst. And this is not to talk about catalyst of, of how we've done. I'm, you're, I typically, in fact, this is the only presentation I've ever done where I share some numbers with people because our backers have been institutions like Service Corp International, but for the most part, it's these large institutional families. And the reason I went after large institutional families is that most of the large institutional families think generational. And so when I went to those families and said, we don't know how long it's going to take to add value to portfolio companies, but we don't want to cut ourselves short. So if we have a good company, we want to be able to keep it for a long period of time. And, they, and I said, um, well, how long is too long? And, he, they, and one of them said, we've never sold a company, so we don't care. And so I said, well, how about 30 years? So our first two partnerships, we did, a, we did a mezzanine fund and we did an equity fund so that when we went to find businesses, if one of them's a rocket ship already and they don't want to give up a significant amount of equity, 
then we would recommend to them a mezzanine fund. That's actually what we did with, um, with LHC Group. But at the time that we did that, we were early enough stage, our loan to the company resulted in us having 8% of the company at that point in time. So it was a significant return for our shareholders if they held it all the way through the period. Now, I did. I stayed in this company for 22 years, and LHC was a holding I've kept for forever. So anyway, so it worked out just fine. But what, so those two 30-year partnerships, and I was too young to know that I couldn't do that, so I just said, how about 30 years? But I guarantee you there's no private equity person that's done that. But I have a real kinship to the microcap club because we shop in the same markets. And that's what I really like about what you guys do because I've suffered from this, I grew up a mutt, so I get that chip on my shoulder. So I love it when the big guys that are the big private equity firms doing their investments, they look down on somebody that's in the lower middle market. And the question they always ask me when I meet them, they go, what are you gonna be when you grow up? And I'm like, I'm pretty grown, so I think I'm gonna stick here. And I've, I kind of equate that back to the microcap club because you guys are seeing deals at a level that you can invest and really watch the, the, the strategy get executed. It's a whole lot easier to take a company that's a 50 million in revenue and drive it to the next level than it is to start with one at several billion and think you're gonna turn that battleship quickly. So I like this market. I'm always gonna be in this market, and so that's what we do. But if you, if you see, we've done nine, nine investment partnerships with four SPVs. The reason I did the SPVs is because at that point in time, I wasn't 100% sure how long I wanted to keep investing, and I wanted to start doing it with individual ones, and one of those SPVs happens to be where we, how we bought Sonera. And so in that, I wanted that SPV to have latitude to do things that I typically hadn't done with the funds. And so in that SPV that, um, that Sonera is inside of, I actually bought a research and development company before we ever launched with Sonera. And that was because the owner of that, of that research and development company, it was a husband and wife, they were both National Academy of Engineering members but he had the distinction of he invented the gas permeable contact lens. That is the breathable contact lens that ended up at Bausch and Lomb, and that's what created Bausch and Lomb's major home run was that. And while he was doing that, he started studying biofilm behind the eye and things like that that really gave rise to bad infections in your eyes with that solid contact, et cetera. And so he started saying, hmm, this has got applications for wound care. So that's how we got into that. And they had been a self-sustaining company through uh, SBA grants, NIH grants, et cetera. And they had such a good reputation. So they had come to me and said, we're a developer, but we really don't want to license out products anymore. We want to be a part of a company. So our charge was, get them to create their, their good products, and then we would go looking for a home to put those products or a vehicle that which, which we can do. And so that kind of leads into what we do differently, and I'll talk about those examples as well. You know, so we, when we, when we go after a company, actually we've never bid on a company so we don't bid on auctions because i'm not looking for a russian bride okay that that i can get have a relation i've been married a long time okay and so i think of that same mindset which is i want a founder's mindset i've learned over my 30 plus years of doing this people sell for a reason but it's not the reason that most people think it's not that they want more money if you've got a successful company, you've already got lots of money. And most of these owners live pretty low-key lives. And so they're very, very wealthy. And they've saved a lot of money. So you're not going to make them wealthy. They either do it because they think they've, they've come to a roadblock. 
that they can't take it any further because of their own capabilities or they're unwilling to take the risk to go the next level or they have they've been they got ill they have no kids to take it over and they finally think well it's maybe time for me to to, to go to the house so it's always those kinds of interesting things so we go to them and say when we meet them and we say we can help you with that and in many cases they stay in the business with us there was not too long ago five years ago we bought a software company from two founders and they were 78 and 70, 74 and 78. They each kept 10%. And they, and they loved the idea that we were not going to rent their company for three years and flip it like a private equity firm would do. But we were going to stay with it and drive it. And they had kids in the business, but the kids were, that they were super smart females that had way good capability to, to run the business, but they had kids at home and didn't want to go do that. So they helped us find the new CEO, and we jointly did that together. They retained 10%, and part of our payoff to the payout to these guys was an earnout. And to show you their mindset and how they think, we said, okay, here's this earnout, and they said, well, when it came time for them to get the earnout, they, um, I mean, they said, no, they said, uh, on this earnout, um, how are you guys going to finance that? And I said, well, we got plenty of cash flow because we don't leverage companies hardly at all when we begin because it's really hard to go to an owner and say, my dollars are worth more than your dollars, even though your dollars are value inside the company. So we don't do any kind of funky structures. We just say, okay. We'll team with you, and we'll come in all equity. And then we use modest leverage the way it should be. And that was one thing Bob Waltrip taught me. Bob Waltrip was buying companies. They bought hundreds and hundreds of companies. And they'd buy them on a line of credit. And then they'd take it and go do a debt offering into the marketplace. And J.P. Morgan one day said, we're calling the note due. And they had billions of dollars in this short-term vehicle. And Bob Waltrip said, I broke the, the cardinal rule of you don't use leverage to buy businesses on a short-term basis. Use leverage for working capital and then long-term assets that you're buying. And so he said that cost us dearly. They recovered from all of that and became still the leader in the industry. And so, but with the, but back to this uh, two that, that bought the company out that we bought it from, they said, um, how are you going to pay for this earnout? And we said, well, we've got plenty of capacity, so we're just going to go to the bank. And they go, well, what's that going to cost you? And we, at the time, it was, it was, uh, it was uh, 4%. And he said, well, we'll do it for that. I go, it's your earnout. He goes, yeah, but we love the company. We know it's good. So we sent over a, a collateral agreement so that they had more collateral in the company. And they go, if we have to sign that, we're not doing this earnout. I go, it's your collateral agreement. It is for you. He goes, we know how good the company is. We're not worried about, about you guys paying it off. And so that's the kind of partnership we want to establish. Relationships matter in investing. That's the relationships with the management team. That's the relationships with these owners. And that's something that we are very proud of that, we've, that we have always done. So I'm not going to go through all of this um, stuff that's up there. But we are patient capital. Um, the, when, when we did the public offering, that allowed LHC to pay us off. Okay, so we were paid off, and then we're just shareholders, but we continue to stay. And so we've got, we're very patient capital. That's what we've always been. Um, we've been in multiple businesses uh, for more than 15 years which you just don't find that in your everyday private equity. I don't have a single reference to private equity because I don't think of ourselves as a private equity fund. We think of ourselves as investors that are operators, and you'll see that, um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that in, in, the, in, the, uh, in a few moments. But what we also have is that in our team, we have lots of operators. We have four for either engineers or software uh, developers that have been operators in businesses. And so we have an operational mindset, and that's why we get along with people like Keith 
as well because we get down into the weeds and understand the micro of these businesses and understand where the industries are going and help with that data analytics, et cetera. So here is our team today, and this is, as I've mentioned to you, you know, we've got, um, we've got these, uh, the various operators within our company. And um, take David McWhorter, for instance, that you see up there. Any of you ever see the movie Deepwater Horizon? So that was the spill of Transocean, and that was that big oil spill where the fire blew up on the rig and everything went crazy, and the, and, uh, uh, and the DOJ came in to look at all this and what happened and why did it happen. David was at the helm of that because there's a device called the blowout preventer that was front and center. And David testified before Waxman and his committee. His boss was a sales guy. He was the... CEO of the public company called Cameron that was at front and center because of that BOP. David, my partner, ran the BOP division, which was $1.6 billion business. And David was coaching that CEO during that entire investigation and committee review. And Waxman asked the CEO of Cameron the question, a very technical question that somebody must have fed to him, and he goes, I can't answer that. And he looked at, he saw that David had been coaching him and he goes, young man, he goes, can you answer that question? He goes, I can. So he said, swear him in. So he very systematically walked through the panel and Waxman's committee on the human errors that occurred because it was poor judgment on their part because they didn't have data analytics to understand what they were doing. So they weren't using, looking at meters or anything else. What they did was done what they've done all their life, which is we hear this in the pipe, we see this going on, shut this valve, turn this deal. And David walked them through how this was a series of human errors made on poor judgment with no data that caused it, and the BOP had nothing to do with that. Cameron got off, even though it was the center, they got off with the lowest amount paid for that, for that deal. So David runs our infrastructure business today. That's been a really interesting one for us. We have multiple companies inside of that. And we tend to work with CEOs too that have done it more than one time with us that come back and say, hey, I got a new idea and a new way to do this. But you'll see Sam Mappala. Sam Mappala, you guys know about, if, you, if you're an investor in Scenario, you probably have heard us talk about Tissue Health Plus. That is our post-acute strategy. Sam runs that, and Sam is one of the most gifted people I've met in my lifetime. He has got engineering degree, uh, a computer science degree, but he was a Deloitte Touche consultant before he became an operator. And then he built one of the most successful med tech companies or medical companies around. And I told him, when your non-compete runs out, come join me. And so I've been working with Sam now for about three years. So you can see on this, this is not public yet, but. Um, but he doesn't mind that I share it with you, and that is Bob DeSutter started the healthcare practice for Piper. And Bob is one of the most recognized people in the med tech industry for his understanding of the markets and what happens. He's a, he's, he actually coined the term med tech back when he was trying to separate it from services so that he could do that. But he started that practice, I think it was 30 years ago, and built the largest med tech practice in, on the globe for Piper. So he'll be retiring from Piper. That'll be announced in September, and he's going to come join us. So we've got a pretty good team, and this is what we do. Don Stella, you'll see on there, used to work for Keith. Keith called me one day and said, can you use uh, Don in your wound care business? And I said, we sure can. Don wanted to retire. We didn't really want him being in home health anymore uh, <laughs> as a competitor. So he came over to us, and he actually runs one of our strategies today called Next Level Urgent Care, where we do primary care inside, of, inside the urgent care. So feel very good about that. And that is very different than most of your investors. Our guys didn't come from working for another private equity fund. What's interesting to me is how the private equity industry is filled with people that began as analysts and they actually have never run anything. And then they work their way up and they become a junior partner and then become a partner, but they still never run anything. Now they got a lot of experience watching, 
but they don't have a lot of experience with hands-on. And I think that's a big difference and differentiator from what, what we see in the marketplace. So as you can see, you know, we've, one of the things we try to do every day, so we either are trying to identify a platform like we consider Scenario to be a platform, either identify a platform or find a technology that does not have a home for its technology inside of a platform. So either we're looking at and identifying unique platforms in the healthcare industry predominantly, but we've done it in the, um, we've done it in the uh, critical infrastructure business today. That company will do critical infrastructure, will do about 40 million, I think it is roughly this year. That's up from 7 million when we started. And they've been able to flip over to a pretty um, successful uh, EBITDA number, but they've been building technologies all along the way for the infrastructure business, starting at the pipeline, going into the plant, into power, into water, et cetera. And they'll probably do a little over 15 million of EBITDA on their $40 million number today. So, and that's run by a very successful leader that came to us and said, I want to go back into this industry. I built a billion dollar business as a CEO of this business. I left them because I didn't really have significant ownership and I wanted to go do it again. And he came to us with a strategy that our team worked out. And so that's what we do. And, and because we're always doing that, of looking for these platform opportunities, or a technology, or a disruptive strategy, we, that's our focus and what I tell our team, we have a very easy strategy to lay out, which is every day we need to be identifying a technology or a disruptive strategy or a platform, or you need to be adding value to an existing portfolio company. And if you're not doing that, then you're not following your job. And so it sounds easy, but it's complex, as you know, in this business. It's just like finding something in the public market and identifying something that's unique that you guys could sink your teeth into and know that it's got all the right capabilities to grow. So um, I'll give you a couple of examples. You guys know the Sonera story, I think, so I won't go back over that one again. You know LHC because you just heard it from Keith. Next level I mentioned to you because it was a strategy where they do primary care inside the urgent care. And what's unique about them is they did actually do this nine to nine, seven days a week. You can schedule your physicals with next level. And so you can set an appointment for a Friday or Saturday or Sunday and not have to go miss work if you don't want. So it appeals to employer groups. And today under that uh, per member per month strategy, uh, we're pretty close to 100,000 lives in that strategy today. And we'll just continue to expand. We have 44 locations with that one. It's a um, female-led business. She is a phenomenal entrepreneur. This is her ninth company to start. And uh, it's, it's one that we are very, very proud of. We did a uh, business, you'll see Triad on there. That was done in one of our, in our special purpose vehicle. And the purpose of that one was, this is a group that, that I knew for a long time. They came to us with a unique strategy for a wound care product. And so the whole goal was to uh, get it inside of Sonera in the early days. But when I took them around and introduced them to a bunch of different companies while we're looking at what we could do together, um, they saw that they had created a lot of value on their own and we were a minority investor so they decided to go a different direction and they sold that this is all public information they sold it to um to one of the big public companies in europe and sold it for 300 million and that was from a dead standstill so it was a startup that went that sold for 300 million so it was it's it was um, um as an investor, I was happy that we got a phenomenal return, but as, but as with my Sonera hat on, I was really disappointed that that didn't end up being as part of our portfolio. Uh, it just didn't happen. So um, give you a couple of the unique ones. Uh, sport clips, anybody ever had a haircut from sport clips? Okay, so we started that with four units and it was miserable when we started because I learned a valuable lesson. I've been in three different franchisors and one, one thing you learn when you're a franchisor, 
that monies that you promise everybody that's a franchisee that you'll put in for advertising and all this stuff, it sounds like a small number because it's like 2% of your gross revenue. But when you think about your gross revenue starts at about average 7%, 2% is a big percentage. Next thing you know, you go, huh, I'm having to support these units and we're not very big. And so kind of the threshold that you'll see out there is you need 100 units out there as a franchisor to start making headway. And so the founder of that, we were a minority partner with him providing expansion capital, and we were in it for 15 years. And I stopped to see him about six months ago. He's 81 years old, and his kids run it today. They're super bright. And he said, um, remember how brutal it was to uh, go from 400 to, I mean, four units to 100? And I said, it was unbelievable. And we spent every waking moment thinking about, are we going to make it? He said, remember how easy it was to go from 100 to 500? I go, yeah. And he said, look on the wall. And he had a counter on the wall, and it goes off two times per week with new store openings. So he's opening more units than Chick-fil-A does. All right? So that's a pretty good testament. It's the 17th largest franchise in the world today. And I told him, I said, you know you hoodwinked me because what he did at 500 units, he called me and said, hey, I want my kids to come in and run this for me. And he goes, and you're going you're gonna to hold them accountable and you're going to grade their papers. And he goes, it's going to bother me that you're grading my kids' papers. And so I said, well, you so hoodwinked me because they've taken it to almost 2,000 units and you knew they were good and you knew I would spot that they were good. And so, and so, but when he bought us out, he called me and this is how, when you have great partnerships, this is how it works. It took five minutes to do our deal. He said, I'm going to overpay you to get you to leave because you've been great partners. And he said, so would you entertain taking this? And we said, sure. And we did. And then we moved on and it was a huge home run for them and great for us as well. So um, that's what we are driven by is making these. And, and Sonera's LHC is... Not the only public company, nor Sonera, that we've ever done. We did ACR Group. That was a uh, $10 million distribution business with a great operator that we teamed with. And we took it public, and it achieved about $350 million in revenues and was sold out to one of the other publicly traded big uh, air conditioning distribution businesses. And then I don't have it on here, I don't think, but um, uh, you have you ever – yeah, I do have it on there. You ever um, – if you're if you're in the in anywhere in the Texas market, you would have known about Jexa uh, Energy, and Jexa Energy was the one of the first retailers for the electric uh, business in Texas. It was public, it was small, it was a microcap company, and it was I think when we did the deal, I think it was 50 cents a share, uh, something no 36 cents a share I believe I can't quite remember, and then it was and then we sold it for about um, 20 times that to uh, Florida Power and Light. So, and again, that was, and that one was an example of having a really lousy leader that, that we recognized pretty early on and talked him into leaving. And we brought in the guy that ultimately was the kind of king of the industry who came in to run that business. And we stole him from Reliant Electric that ran all their retail stuff. So, you know, it's one of the key things I would tell you is you have the luxury if you're a public company, if you're owning public companies, you don't have to worry about a transition. So you guys can just sell the business and walk away. You can't do that when you're a private business. So when we make a bad, mis bad mistake on people, we have to correct it and correct it quickly to get the course right so that we can make sure we can still win. So thank you. If there's any questions, happy I got to. A, we got about maybe five, 10 minutes. And just as a reminder, Ron's gonna be around all day. So he'll be here for lunch, he'll be at the social tonight. So if you have any questions, you can talk to him directly. Um, but maybe we have a time for a couple and I'm gonna steal one of these from somebody else. But can you talk a bit about your due diligence process into the businesses and also the people? Mm -hmm. Sure. So most of my mistakes happened in my first 15 years because we didn't have a big network. So when I would really try to run deep on backgrounds, you know, I learned a, a very valuable lesson. People always take, get social security numbers, driver's license numbers, and then they run background checks. But what they don't look for, they're looking mostly for criminal activity, whatever. 
I learned that if you really want to understand somebody's background, you go run civil litigation in the counties that they have lived in around for their past 20 years. And that's what we did. And I did that as a result of not catching things that I could have, because what happens is this, this seldom does a crook ever face charges, especially for white collar crimes or even bad behavior. But you can see it in the civil litigation. And I've learned that. So in our first 15 years, I had three of those painful mistakes that we corrected. In the, pa in the past 15 years, we've had none. And so we go way deeper on our diligence related to who they are that's running the business, what's their background, what was their success, how are they from a judgment and values perspective? That's something that Keith and I learned a long time ago. It was, he referenced Dan Wilford. And Dan Wilford was a friend of mine in Houston, and he was iconic. He's in the Healthcare Hall of Fame with the Mayo Clinic brothers. He said that's not something to brag, brag about because they're dead. And so, <laughs> but uh, he, uh, he told Keith and I about a test that he would run called the Hartman Value Profile. And it's not a psychological test. It is to look at your judgment and your values. And he said he cut his turnover rate by 50% by implementing that. And we implemented it at LHC Group. I don't know, Keith, do they still use it? Yep. So it's, it's remarkable, too, because you can, you can – what was so interesting is Keith was such a, is a, such a great leader that you could see by the people that he would hire in his in – his, um, uh, next level lieutenants all the way down. We had it go down two levels. Is that correct, Keith? You went to senior and then one level down on regional. Now three levels. So, but you could see that the numbers were all tracking that you were. They were hiring really good people, and Keith made the board take take it just like them. And it was really. And Keith, I remember when he took it and I took it. He called me. He goes, "You take that deal." He goes, "I said, yeah." He goes, "You get." You, what's your scores? And so he and I were comparing scores with one another to see how well we aligned. It was spooky how close we were to each other. But it was, it was funny because he goes, do you feel violated after taking that? And I said, I do. <laughs> and so because it's like somebody, this, the inventor of this was trying to figure out how during the war did you get people to line behind somebody like, it was paid for by the U.S. government, and it was, how did Hitler get people to align behind him? And it's failure of good judgment and failure of values. And, the, and there were multiple illustrations of this company that could show you the people that took this test that failed in life miserably, but never would have been caught had they not taken this test because of the poor values, et cetera. And so anyway, that's, that was part of the answer to your question, Ian. But the rest is we have, we have teams of external people that we go to for specific diligence related to the areas of uh, needed expertise that we do. We do it on legal. We do it on, we do it on um, the operational front. And because we try not to go into new industries today. We go into the industries we know. We've mostly, we do what I call subset industries. Like if you take healthcare and say, well, I'm a healthcare investor. Well, there's hundreds of segments underneath the healthcare. And we look at those as subsets. And we have been in more than 70 um, subset industries. And we try to stay in the subsets that we have expertise in. And then we know who does diligence in those areas. So, Th Thank you, Ron. That's going to be it. And again, Ron will be around the rest of the day. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.